I thought we'd have more men. We still have our objective. You take a company to the James Street entrance. I'll go in the Rialto side and I'll meet you in the middle. Carl, can I read that? How does that take? Ogly in the heron. At midday, the dream we have held for so long will become a reality. The Irish Republic will be proclaimed today at 12 noon, Easter Monday, the 24th of April, 1916. Simultaneous with the action we are about to undertake, armed divisions of the Army of the Republic will occupy dominating points throughout the city. Men, it is our task to take the South Dublin Union. We must hold it at all costs to the very end. I pray God's blessing upon you all. Good night, Rilin. I guess I'll see you in the end. The Rialto entrance is taken, and I've left Irvine and most of his company guarding the gate. McCarthy is in Rose Distillery with about 20 men. How did you get on? Good. James's gate is barricaded and fortified. Right. We can't hold the whole damn place, not with the amount of men we have. What do you suggest, Lieutenant Cosgrave? What about the night nurse home? It's solid. There's only the one entrance. It overlooks Mount Brown, Brookfield Road, and the Rialto gate. If we fortify it properly, it'll take a whole battalion to get through. He's right. Let's do it. Move out! Eamon Kent is by far the least well-known of the members of the Military Council that planned the rising and of the signatories to the proclamation. It's clear that this man is a separatist to his fingertips. This is a man who really is a physical force Republican, who believes that the only thing that the British understand is uh, being talked to for, uh, from the barrel of a gun. Eamon Kant was born in the town of Ballymow in County Galway on the 21st of September 1881. He spent his first three years in the town barracks, where his father, James Kent, was stationed as an officer in the RAC. When his father retired from the force, the family moved to Dublin, and it was here in the Christian Brothers School on North Richmond Street that Eamon Kant took his first steps on the road to becoming a nationalist. It's interesting to note that if you look at the 1916 rebellion leaders and, of course, the, the, the rank and file, most of them, the vast majority of them, were all ex-pupils of the Christian Brothers. They turned out very well-educated young men who were indoctrinated almost by the idea of a nationalist Ireland. Well, the whole of the sprag spread in our own nation here, and I dare not to hear the Kamora shock the no hot agus cogan amorics in Africa. Where Eamon seems to be the son, the son of the son of the son, and the son of the son is the son of 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 the son na hiran mar homeless ich yola gesrinke nicht mal alle hemen fein wie sie mir gesagt hange ach wie ane hemige sich yol choma hein sche orli sche gsule ach wie sie fühle hegeis ne pi wielen ages wann ich fein ages karlas edward martin a common a beer bri im latlie zu lien miele negiert i think canter did see the music as equally valid in ways as another aspect of the, of the whole Gaelic uh, League idea. And in fact, the Piper's Club is, is referred to, when it was founded, as being an offshoot of the Gaelic League. So it could easily have just been an appendage, but Kant kind of, his input into it made, it made a much greater impact than it otherwise would have, you know. And he also shaped his policy to a large extent 
it, he laid great emphasis on finding the old players wherever they were. The club used to write round to the secretaries of Gaelic League branches all over the country, have you any old pipers in your area? Uh, give us the name and we'll pay their fare up to Dublin for the Eroctus or the Fesh Keogh and that. So that means that people actually heard these old players and uh, cylinder recordings were made of them in 1899. So we have about a dozen cylinders of people. In Martin Riley's case, the great Gaulet Piper, he was born in 1832. So he was about 67 when he was recorded. So you can see these, these links going back to Kant's time. It's not often seen that if he hadn't been as active as he was, an awful lot have been, would have been lost, you know, that at, at one stage, piping, if a, half a dozen people had died or had otherwise stopped playing or, you know, simply emigrated, uh, the, the tradition could easily have collapsed. Kant was a talented piper himself, and in 1908 he accompanied a group of athletes representing Ireland at the Papal Sports in Rome. Kant led the Irish contingent out onto the field, and the Pope was so taken with the sound of Kant's pipes that he requested a personal audience with the Irish team. Hogdenagen led the aim in Kant, August Holmer, a a car ne pibi en ardu agus ek tosnu agus vise ek skradal mor vine pibri ek tosnu agus wulse a stocks a shomra as ar gor agus varshal se ok no denura susukishis as kor an an fafa. Through his involvement with the Gaelic League, Kant became more committed to the nationalist movement and came into contact with many of the leading cultural nationalists of the day, including men like Owen McNeill and Patrick Pearce. The Nadini Kena Gominic ran for Tuck in Snaglushuk the Shogalair. Kurgas, Dini Aglak part, a gunner in a Gaelia, Kudar Stack, a Shin Fain Lo no Maul, Dini Aglak part in Arkland the Manistruk, Kulahans Gurkloriuk Eid as Kunra in a Gaelia. So Mara Harley and Gominic in St. Tier Shaw, but you Nadini Kena V. Kuntusik Gominic, a Glushuk Kulturha V. An Shakas Glushuk Fulatul. Agus Dort um, Standish O'Grady and Far Edal Shiglaur Er Kukulan in Snohokde Shachto Day. There'll be a cultural movement, it won't be very important. Then there'll be a political movement, it will be quite important. Then there will be a military movement, and it will be very important indeed. Er Valok Ded Harag or Marshina Harlashe on Vlian Milaneged Amak Godi Neduk Sheduk. Lads, get them bags upstairs to HQ. Start sandbagging the windows. That's it, men. I want that stairs barricaded and secured. Carl, I'm putting you in charge of this barricade. Nothing gets up or down those stairs. But will I still agree you? The South Dublin Union was a vast workhouse complex that covered 52 acres. It was located next to the British barracks at Richmond and Island Bridge and also overlooked the Keys and Kingsbridge Station, or Houston Station, as it is known today. This was the main point of entry into the city for British reinforcements arriving from the Curragh. Many of the devolved garrisons were chosen with one view only, to delay the approach of British military. Hence the attacks on the rail lines, hence the barricading of the arterial roads into Dublin on the north side, hence the establishment of a garrison in the South Dublin Union and the four courts to impede the progress of various British forces located in the satellite uh, barracks around Dublin, and was always a heavily garrisoned capital city, uh, from getting into the centre of their communications.
In 1899, Kant secured a position with Dublin Corporation as a treasurer. It was a well-paid job and Kant was a hard-working, dedicated employee. But the work left him feeling unfulfilled. Cahinshea <laughs> Well, that's going great. I mean, can't the law here like Krinu when they should read the story, she needs to do it. Like we part of my parish, because on what day the law here in Krinu came. Ah, the him after him she is learning a great more on doch she gets in Goris Politoil. But she that's going more humble than Lua in this trilogy. Ganur che Krinu the great hin fein. Gachor gmeach and train all a gach far ernach Gorsi Aram. Agus fui yaren a blianishan vishu thort kind to the hinfein er the failure of constitutionalism. He was far before you know Pierce in the sense that when Pierce in 1912 would be satisfied with home rule, Kant was was way ahead of him on that one. He was thinking this is going to be a separatist Ireland. There's going to be no home rule or we're going to have an independent republic, and and that's why he was so he became so committed to the whole rebellion as well. You know, that was the, that was his. That was kind of a feature of his personality. You know, once he set his mind to do something, there was nothing that would stop him, you know? It was all or nothing for Eamon Kant. In the presence of God, I, Eamon Kant, do solemnly swear to do my utmost to establish the national independence of Ireland. And that I will bear true allegiance to the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and government of the Irish Republic and that I will bear true allegiance to the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and Government of the Irish Republic. And implicitly obey the Constitution of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and all my superior officers. He's recruited into the IRB by Sean McDermott. One of McDermott's many functions is as, as a talent spotter, and he talent spots Kent uh, and swears him into the IRB because he recognised that in this person were certain qualities that could be very, very useful to the IRB. And that I will preserve inviolable the secrets of the organisation. Valcha. Grimacha. Sintachan Laishoho. Eamon Kant always said that his heart lay in the west of Ireland, where he was born. He often organised trips for members of the Gaelic League to the Aran Islands and to the Gaeltacht area of Spiddle. It was on one of these trips that he met the woman he would marry, Anya Brennan. Anya joined the Gaelic League and it was an excursion to Galway that they actually met and she said that it was his, his beautiful whistling that attracted her and she walked down to see who was, who was, who was doing all this 
he was he was musical in every way, in every sense. And she saw him and she said that it was the way as he looked at her uh, that she immediately fell in love with him. Uh, it, it's actually a profound love story in a sense, Emma Kant's, uh, because you, you can see in her writings that uh, she totally loved this man and uh, she became treasurer of the local branch. He was secretary of the local branch, so they obviously had a... Maybe that was a design by both of them. They could spend more time together. He proposed to her in 1903 and they were married in June 1905. And their one and only child was born a year later, Ronan. Kirk <laughs> Nesquilhuinusle <laughs> The rare are Dorum, is our Dulla Hain. Agus Maradjarshi de Merla. If peaceful methods fail, then let there be war. <laughs> Throughout the first day of the rising, the British forces attempted to gain entrance to the South Dublin Union, and by mid-afternoon, there were heavy losses on both sides. Eventually, the rebels' defences at the Rialto Gate were breached, and Kant ordered his forces to withdraw to the nurses' home, which was now heavily fortified. Most of the fighting in the South Dublin Union eventually is reduced to the nurse's home. And you literally had people passing one side of a wall and on the other side. It's not actually literally hand-to-hand -hand fighting in that sense, but it's up close and personal. The Hogley, can I have your attention, please? <coughs> I have here a dispatch from the President of the Provisional Government of the Irish Republic. The rebellion is going well in Dublin and the whole centre of the city is in the hands of the Republic, whose flag flies from the GPO. British ships are being attacked in the Irish Sea and our German allies are expected to land at any moment. Reports show that the country is rising and bodies of men from Kildare and Fingal have already reported in Dublin. We have lived to see an Irish Republic proclaimed. May we live to establish it firmly, and may our children enjoy the happiness and prosperity which freedom will bring. Signed on behalf of the Provisional Government, P. H. Pierce. Goma Gerar Hluna, Agus Thormad Buechus Gontirna Dun Khawar. Nanam Nair, Agusin Vik, Agusin Spurid Nev, Amen. Or Nahar at Harnav, Ganefer Danam, Kadag the Riacht, Ganyent of the Holler and Talamar and Yenter Nav. Kent is more naturally a military man than someone like McDonough. He's fierce, he's tenacious, uh, he's a man who will involve himself absolutely with, in the action when the bullets start flying, and he's there at the front. Um, and his performance during Easter week in the South Dublin Union 
Apart from Connolly, I think, at the GPO, is the most impressive of all the Dublin commandants. He puts his neck on the line, he leads from the front, the men admire him, uh, and he does something else which uh, none of the other Dublin commandants did during Easter week. He actually killed a man. Um, he killed a, uh, a British soldier in a, in a fierce fire, firefight in the nurse's home of the South Dublin Union. Not something that caused him much upset. After the surrender, one of the uh, volunteers who were with him, who was with him at the South Dublin Union, they're talking about it, and he comments, you could see the obvious satisfaction in his face as he related the story of how he had killed the man. <laughs> In early 1913, with the prospect of home rule looking more certain, the Ulster Volunteer Force was formed by Ulster Unionists determined to keep Ireland within the United Kingdom. In response, it was decided that a Nationalist Volunteer Force be formed, and a meeting was held in Dublin in Wynne's Hotel to discuss the issue. On the 10th of November, 1913, Eamon Kent got a letter from the O'Reilly inviting him to a, a meeting in Wynne's Hotel. And it was at that meeting it was decided that the volunteer movement would be founded. It, it took another couple of weeks for them to actually organise the whole, the whole uh, I think the 25th of November, and they held a huge rally at the Rotunda Rink. 4,000 was the capacity, 7,000 turned up, and 3,000 joined immediately. Within 12 months, there was some 180,000 members. Stoop your back to the burden. Keep your eye clear and your nerves steady. Be skilled in the arts of war and there will be no war. Live plainly so that you may be strong and hardy. Be not given to vain boasting. Do not tarry long in taverns nor take counsel with those who would betray you. Keep your own counsel. Be simple, be efficient, be noble and the world of Ireland is yours. Ogle in the Heron, you have signed up to defend our homeland. This is our land and it is worth fighting for. Tashe the Rulgas are in the Hus point. Go will drown Bjog Gwail on Fos, Nach will Kianahag or Sean Vui. Tashe the Hart a Gachail, a Tarn of Rail, Aramahogail. Agasay a Hena Olvu, Gola and Chaha. It wasn't just the Gaels who were readying themselves for war. The Great War broke out in Europe in August 1914, and the IRB resolved to stage a rising before it was over. A military council was formed, and Damon Kant was appointed to it, along with Patrick Pearce and Joseph Plunkett. These three had been handpicked by Tom Clark and Sean McDiarmida who had been steering the drive towards insurrection for years. Well, Amy Kant, once he joined the military council and he became, you know, we'll say, one of the architects of the rebellion, the meetings that they were holding were becoming more technical in the, in the sense of when the rebellion was going to happen, not if a rebellion was going to happen, when it was going to happen. And on records that uh, in January 1916, the IRB started to hold their military uh, council, the, the military council meetings in their home in Two Dolphins Barn.
Kent while he was a committed father and a loving husband, um, you can see that in, in his letters to her and, in, and indeed in her recordings of him and totally committed dad, but he felt that for the future generations of Ireland, for his own children and for his grandchildren's sake, that something had to be done, that they had to control their own destiny in a sense. And he felt that this was the only way forward. You know, he, he had seen home rule over the years, that the, the promise of it being pushed out and pushed out. He saw the, what was termed the Curra Mutiny, that, uh, that the, the officers said they would not enforce home rule in Ulster. He saw the Ulster Unionists under Carson sign against home rule, some of them in their own blood. So he knew that this was not going to happen. There was only one thing that was going to bring this to the table. This is what he felt, that the only thing that was going to bring this, to put an Irish independent movement on the table, was actually a rebellion. I'm going to borrow if we go to Achnilein Gagamil. It's just there for yourself and Ronan's protection. But what if Ronan finds it? He won't find it. They're really starting to crack down on us. If we don't protect ourselves, who will? Tasha Haravet Dakar Domsa Mar Ar Klinna on Machina Hishkind, Connus Sabajer, the Fair Ladulgashi Klinna, La Post Yoga, on Contour Chinaglaka. Is Minikadort John McGahern Lumsa on Screenor, uh, Garodar or Ain Danov, Le Locht Islam, a Lahrnahura, a Yapin Gwil Arts, Rauna Akut Snaflahish, Agas Gurfeger Casa, won't heal Shaw, Gudian Sealella, Martan Kesht Kena, Lakar and Stoke, a Lahrnahura, if we write what Dina Tas as the Ebert and Tai Sunny Yen of Gohexella, Agas Beger Garau. Uh, nos na diagogta agus na siana creduinti nis loidstres na fir sin na marata in air nigna lina sha. Don't trust them. Throughout Easter week, British reinforcements arrived in Dublin and the authorities set about crushing the rebel strongholds. On Thursday, British troops launched a major attack on the South Dublin Union and Kant's headquarters in the nurses' home came under heavy fire. There is no question of surrender. We fight to the last man. Why did you not hold your position? Who told you to retreat? The order came in through Mullen. Captain Mullen received his order directly from Commandant Brewer. Where's Brewer? He's holding the barricade. I think he's been hit. Cannel Brewer is almost uh, a replica of Kent and vice versa. I think one person described Cannel Brewer as a hard hater of England, and so was Kent. And um, Cal Brewer is in the thick of it. He's caught up in a firefight, and I think he takes it's about 25 wounds to him, at least, I think, nine of which were serious. There was a huge barricade, about eight foot erected, and one of them lobbed a Mills bomb over it and wounded Cal Brewer. He was wounded at that stage. But Brewer dragged himself away from the barricade and he started to sing God Save Ireland. Save Ireland, said they all. While they're on the scaffold high, or the battlefield we die. And every, between every verse, he'd fired a few shots at the barricade. And this kind of inspired Kant immediately, who went to, went to his aid. And he ordered, he said, we're taking the barricade back and we're forcing these people back. And that's what they did. It was a renewed attack on behalf of the rebels. And they actually forced their way back down the corridor. They just kept firing until the, 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 the British pulled back. The Sachnamacht Erna, Norudi, Bawo, Sonari Mach, Erairalob, Vishidanan, Aaron the Bratton, Achon Yalamachas, Agus, Danchi the Shelev, Nonachin, Gazid Erna, Nairi Mach. The 
Everyone's ablaze, or the whole city's on fire. They mean to end us. Even if it means burning the whole country. When boyhood's fire was in my blood, I read of ancient free men. For Greece and Rome they bravely stood, Three hundred men and three men. And then I prayed I yet might see Our fetters rent in twain. On Sunday morning, about uh, 11 o'clock, uh, Tom McDonough and uh, Father Aloysius, or F.M. Cap, came uh, up the street uh, with a white flag over, the, over, the, over them, they walked up the James Street. Uh, we saw them, and of course, there was immediately some, uh, well, we were excited. Uh, they came up and uh, admitted, and uh, they went uh, privately at a top with Kent. Commandant Kent. Father. What do you have to report? I have correspondence from Connolly and Pierce. They wish us to consider our position. And uh, you will agree to this? Eamon, Tan Kars Christe. I've been through from Boland's Mills, Sackville Street is down. That may be so. But I've men in there that are willing to die for their country. I'll take a vote on it. And if they want to continue the fight, I'm willing to lead them. Nor four cant and tardo come a charco gale. A stoiker a drogler a yenamar sonata a session near a bolsa at the rebellion. Ahogli, I have here a dispatch from headquarters. In order to prevent the further slaughter of Dublin citizens, and in the hope of saving the lives of our followers now surrounded and hopelessly outnumbered, the members of the provisional government present at headquarters have agreed to an unconditional surrender. And the commandants of the various districts in the city and country will order their commands to lay down arms. It's signed by Patrick Pierce, President of the Provisional Government of the Irish Republic, and Mr. James Connolly, Commandant of the Dublin Brigade. This is the dilemma which all the commandants had when they received the surrender order. Not just the commandants, but the rank and file. What did you do? Everything in Kent's being revolted against surrender. For him, surrender was death, really. And many of the rank and file were absolutely shattered by it. You had men throwing rifles on the ground. You had grown men sitting in tears. Kent is torn, therefore, between his natural instinct, never to give in, but also 
the fact that he's receiving orders from his commanding officer. When I hear that all Tom Clark, who spent 15 years in British prisons for the love of his country, when I hear that he has consented to this surrender, I know that there is no shame in the men of the 4th Battalion following his lead. Without that unity, they'd never have got the Rising going. They went into the Rising United, and he felt that they had to come out of the Rising United. This unity uh, would have uh, destroyed uh, the credibility of the Rising. And I think probably at that stage, he's thinking towards the future and posterity. What will posterity think of our being on this day? So he goes along with the surrender, but he didn't like it. So then it's decided. We surrender unconditionally. No man should attempt to escape or desert their post. Collect your weapons and eat what rations you have left. We will meet for assembly at the main gate in half an hour. And men, can I just say how proud I am to have led such brave soldiers. When the surrender comes, Kent remains the man that he had always been. And from his point of view, there was no false chivalry at the end. When the British officer came up to him to take the surrender, the British Army officer surprisingly extends his hand and Kent refuses to shake it. And when the British Army officer uh, says, where's the rest of your men? It's only 44 here. Kent says, this is all I had. But we gave a very good account of ourselves during this week, and we held up your army for a week. Kent and his men were marched to Richmond Barracks, where Kent was identified by DMP detectives as one of the leaders of the rebellion. He was court-martialed and sentenced to death. On the 7th of May, he was transferred to Kilmainham Jail, where he was to be executed at dawn the following day. Tor Arawa hold the warring. Go go to dia and vertigi. Agus go dugas she sail father fui ho. Agus fui wash a river rain. Go sail a dia era. My dearest Anya, my poor little sweetheart of how many years ago, ever my comforter, God comfort you now. What can I say? I die a noble death for Ireland's freedom. Bich Mishnachad, a story in Machri. Tog the Hian Nagas Bich Fajad go vek me the Hela Rish, if Lahish J. Tossa, Misha. Agus Ronan Bjok Bjok Bocht. Adieu. Amen. When boyhood's fire was in my blood, I read of ancient free men. 
for Greece and Rome, who bravely stood three hundred men and three men. Looking back at 1916, and the leaders of 1916, and in Kant in particular, which I can speak of, I feel a great sorrow for them. I feel they were totally committed to the ideals of an Irish Republic, of an independent Ireland, of an honest Ireland, an Ireland that, that would, would, be, would, be, would be made proud among the nations of the earth. That's what, they've, that's what, they, that was what they, that was their legacy. That's what they wanted to, 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 to achieve. And in a sense, they did to a, to a certain extent. But this year, in, in 19, the 1916 commemoration at Air Square in Galway, a lady stood on the footpath beside me, watching the whole thing being prepared. And she said to me, she just turned and she said, you know, they died for nothing, she said. She was very upset at what's happened in the country today. And this is, this is what she was coming from, like most people are in, the, in Ireland today. And immediately she said it a second time, they died for nothing. That's the way as I see it. And for that moment, I agreed with her. They actually did die for nothing because their ideals seemed to be totally uh, ignored. And then the pipe, the piper started to play the pipes. And immediately, I could feel the hair standing on the back of my neck. I thought of him in Kant immediately. He was such a wonderful, fantastic piper and such a wonderful, fantastic Irish man. And I just turned to him and I said, look at I said, I agree that you might feel that they died for nothing given what's happened in the country. But now more than ever, I said, we have to acknowledge those men and the sacrifice they made all those years ago in the Stonebreakers' Yard in 1916. Now more than ever, we're going to have to remember them with respect and dignity and take this country back and make it what they died for and make people think about the good of the country, the good of the people and not the good of the individual. Ireland has shown she is a nation. In the years to come, Ireland will honour those who risked all for her honour at Easter 1916. Squad, ready? 